haven't had organic, it's okay. We're going to teach you what you need to know about organic chemistry. First, we're going to start, start talking about carbon in general, um, how we have a saturated and unsaturated carbon, what a geometric isomer is, and then we're going to move on to what gives our uh, organic chemistry molecules uh, function. They're called functional groups. We're going to need to learn those. So there's a bit of memorization that you're going to have to do. And then um, we're going to practice those and then see the types of reactions that um, organic chemistry um, reactions are in. So I apologize for those of you that have had organic. This is a chance for you to um, maybe add something to the lecture, tell, tell others how you um, learn things. Um, this is only from Orgo 1. I don't go into Orgo 2 stuff. So it's really um, very basic. So if you went, remember one thing about this entire portion of lecture is that carbon has the ability to do four bonds. Four bonds. All right? If it has four bonds, then it's said to be a saturated carbon. It's saturated with bonds. The shape is tetrahedral. Remember valence shell electron pair repulsion theory? You have your trigonal planar tetrahedral. This is a nice shape of a tetrahedral. I used to do this in my organic chem exams. You're not allowed to have models, but look what you have right here. You have two models right here. Those of you that took organic, did you do this during the exam? Oh yeah. And I would write on my fingers. So my palm is the, the carbon. I have one bond coming out at you. It's not perfect. It's not a perfect tetrahedral, but it's pretty close. So one bond coming out at you, one bond going back into the board, and then two bonds on the plane. All right. So this is tetrahedral. This tetrahedral shape is responsible for carbon being able to make a <coughs> limitless number of molecules. It is amazing. Now, when it has four single bonds, we have free rotation about those bonds. So here's our tetrahedral shape. This is how we draw it. The dotted line goes back, and the wedge is coming out at you. And then there's two lines. Um, to in the plane. Um, we're really too lazy to do this. So we just draw like that. This is the expanded structural formula um, because that's a lot of work to do this. But I drew this little arrow because I wanted to show that we have free rotation here. And so if they're all hydrogens, then the, um, the angle is 109. I'm not going to test you on that. All right, so you can have double bonds. You're unsaturated with bonds or unsaturated with things bound to it. So if you have a double bond, then you can only have three substituents. Substituents are thingies. Okay? When I say the word species, I'm also meaning thingy. It just sounds better to say substituent in species, right? So you can have three substituents or things hanging off of it, things bound to it. So when you have a double bond, you can have three things um, bound to it. When you have a double bond, it can't rotate freely. Okay, it's rigid. So here we're showing the, uh, a carbon-carbon double bond. The carbon has one carbon and two hydrogens bound to it, and it's planar. So there's no free rotation here, but it can flip. There is free rotation still between the carbon and hydrogen bond, but not between the carbon-carbon bond. So the double bond is restricted, but the single bonds that are still on that carbon have free rotation. All right. I just want to remind you about our condensed structural formula. This is the um, expanded structural formula, but this one's condensed. So here, what we're showing we know that it's going to be like a carbon chain. So here we have this carbon with what's hanging off of it, then the next carbon, then with what's hanging off of it. Do you guys see that? So we have carbon, two hydrogens hanging off of it. Carbon, two hydrogens hanging off of it. And then another carbon right there with two things hanging off of it. So you have the carbon, and then after the carbon is what's bound to it, and then we also know that it's bound to that next carbon. 
So that's the condensed structural formula. Did that go away? Was that? Okay. And you can show it this way. Oftentimes, if there's a double bond, we'll, we'll show it. And again, that's the expanded. This is more uh, accurate with the, the geometry. Okay, so when you have a carbon-carbon double bond, you have the possibility of having a geometric isomer. Remember, an isomer is uh, when you have two molecules that are made of the same atoms, but they're connected differently. They're not the same uh, molecule. When we have geometric isomers, this is particular to a carbon-carbon double bond. And in order to have a geometric isomer, each carbon must be bound to two different things. So look, let's look at this carbon. It's bound to a hydrogen and chlorine. That's two different things. This carbon is bound to a hydrogen and chlorine. It doesn't have to be bound to the same things that are on the other side. It's just that each carbon of the double bond has to have two different things on it. So here we have cis, dichloroethylene, ethene, and then we have trans. So when the bigger of the two groups, so we could have a bromine over here, right? Or we could have a, another carbon chain, right? But when the bigger of the two on each side are on the same side of the carbon-carbon double bond, we call it cis. When they're on the opposite side of the double bond, then we call it trans. I think of transatlantic, right? You're going across the ocean. So these guys, this one cannot be a, a geometric isomer doesn't have the possibility because each carbon doesn't have two different groups on it. So you have to have both carbons with two different groups on it. We see double bonds in a lot of biomolecules, um, particularly in our fats. Is this one a cis or trans? Pretend that there's, well, let me just back up saying that oftentimes we are extremely lazy and we don't write in our hydrogens. We know that carbon has four bonds, right? And if I'm not drawing them in, then it's going to be hydrogens. So this carbon has how many hydrogens off of it? Three, because it has one other bond. How about this one? Two, right? And so we show this one, it has one, two in the double bonds, and then it has one more here, right? And this one. So that's why that's where you get the four bonds. Two from the double bond, and then three, four. So here we draw the line to show where it would be, but I don't draw the hydrogen. Okay. So is this cis or trans? You might have to put your head like this. It's trans, right? Because here, if you put your head like that, this is on the bottom and this is on the top, right? So that's on the opposite side. So that's trans. Now, if I were to draw out a carbon chain, one carbon, another carbon, another carbon, another carbon, I would draw it out on the board straight. But because of the tetrahedral shape, it's actually a zigzag, like this is. See how it goes up and then down and up and down, up and down, up and down, like that. So having a trans double bond doesn't really change that zigzag shape. We say it lies flat. So whether it has a trans double bond or it's saturated, it lies flat. We call it a straight chain, even though it's a zigzag. If it's a cis double bond, you can see that the, the carbon bigger groups are on the bottom, then what we have is um, an interruption in that zigzag. We have a kink. In your oils, rather than fats, you have cis double bonds. And what happens is um, if you have two saturated chains, as in saturated fat, then one will lie right on the other, OK? Right on the other. And if you have more contact between the two chains, then you have more intermolecular forces, force, dispersive forces holding them together because they're, they're um, hydrophobic, so it's only going to be dispersive forces holding it together. Think of it as Velcro. 
Okay, intermolecular forces are like Velcro. It's easy to break them, but not so easy. So you can raise temperature and break intermolecular forces pretty easy just by taking a bit of fat and putting it on your skillet and you can, you can melt it that way. Your oils are also fats. However, they have a cis uh, double bond in them. So what happens is, say this is my hand is a double bond. What's it doing to the amount of contact? It doesn't lie. You don't have as many intermolecular forces. I'm only touching here and here, right? So they can be ripped apart a lot easier. And going from a solid to a liquid to a gas is breaking those intermolecular forces. So a solid, you have as many intermolecular forces as, as possible. They're, they're, they're only vibrating in, in place, right? A liquid, you're breaking some of them because you can roll past, right? So you have to break the intermolecular forces because they're moving past each other. In a solid, there's none. I mean, in a gas, there's, there's no intermolecular forces holding them together. They're completely separate. So you have to break all of them. So when I'm talking about the difference between a saturated fat, a solid at room temperature, and an oil, an unsaturated fat, I'm talking about the intermolecular forces that are involved in this. A saturated fat has lots of points of contact. So they're going to have, it's going to take a lot more energy to rip, remember, just think of it as the whole, it's like Velcro all along. It takes more energy to rip apart that Velcro, right? So, but if I had, say this was still Velcro, but I had something like this, and this was still Velcro, but it's only touched here and here, then it's easy to rip this part and then this part off, right? So that's why oils are liquid at room temperature, because there's not much to break before they can roll past each other. Did that make any sense? Yes? Okay. So luckily, we have outlawed trans fats. This is from a long time ago, but this is um, after we've really um, said, okay, no more trans fats. But where do we get them? We want them in some of our foods because it adds shelf life and it makes them super yummy. They taste really good. Um, and it's a byproduct of um, partial hydrogenation. So if you take an oil and you say, I want the health benefits of an oil, but I don't want to put oil on my toast in the morning. So what they do is to make margarine is they take oil and they partially hydrogenate. They take out some of the double bonds, not all of them, so it's still spreadable, it's somewhat liquid, but not, not, all, uh, not all of them. So they partially hydrogenate. When you hydrogenate, you're adding hydrogen to that double bond, making a double bond a single bond. So then they would lie flat, be more solid. You still have a little bit that's going to be cis, so that's why your margarine is easier to spread. Your butter is pretty much, if you refrigerate your butter, um, which I hear you should, but I never do, um, is the... Uh, is, is difficult to, um, because it's solid. So um, what happens is, in that hydrogenation process, you put hydrogen into the double bond, the cis double bond, sometimes the trans results, okay, it goes back. It's a reversible reaction. So um, if you eat margarine, how many people eat margarine? House. Anyway, <laughs> it's really have butter. Did you hear that we should be eating full fat yogurt and milk and all that? And I am so happy about that. It is a wonderful thing. I ran out to the grocery store and got like yummy yogurts for me and my family. But anyway, um, so you're going to have, even though the label will say zero trans fats they can still have half a gram of trans fat per serving in claim zero. So your body doesn't know what to do with it. Although when we um, metabolize fats, we actually make a trans bond, which I find interesting, but um, your body doesn't know what to do with the trans fat. It, 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 puts it, it puts it in your, yeah, but I don't know the, the pathway by which it, it does that. Um, so it takes that, it's actually worse than a saturated fat. 
So, um, yeah, even though it behaves like a saturated fat, with being more solid, it, um, yeah, anyway, you guys are gonna remember that. Functional groups. So, what we have is our carbon chains, sometimes with a double bond, sometimes not. And all you really can do with those is burn them, right? Hydrocarbons. We call it, if it's just carbons and hydrogens, we call it a hydrocarbon. But we um, add functionality to these organic uh, molecules by adding what we call functional groups. So it, uh, usually with an oxygen or a nitrogen. So I want to, before we start, I'm going to talk about these structures. We, you see this R in here? R is rest of molecule that I really don't care about. Just probably a carbon chain, but I don't want to talk about it. I'm too lazy to think of or draw out the rest of the molecule. So R stands for rest of molecule. Um, that isn't interesting. And again, we have the carbon bound to this carbon, and then the hydrogen hang on to it. So here, we're going to, um, we're going to talk about these. Um, here, it's just an uh, introduction. So here, the name or class of the compound, the functional group, the name of that functional group, and here's the general structure with the R, and then here's an example. So here, an alkene, or let's talk about, alkanes are just hydrocarbons with all single bonds. Alkenes have the double bond, so the E and E ending makes it a double bond. We don't have triple bonds in biochem, so no alkynes. Alcohols have a hydroxyl group. OH is a, hyd is a hydroxyl group, and um, that makes it an alcohol. Um, and here's ethanol. I'm hoping to have some ethanol later at lunch. Ether has an oxygen interrupting a carbon chain. So remember I said carbon connected to carbon, bound to carbon, bound to carbon. Well, instead of just carbon after carbon, we put an oxygen in the middle. An amine has a nitrogen in it. And nitrogens are group five, right? Nitrogens are group five from the periodic table. So it has five valence electrons. So here we have a lone pair, and then it can go into three, three um, bonds. So we call it an amino group, but it's an amine. We'll find that amines are our, our uh, bases in, in um, biochemistry. So we, uh, the SH is the class of the compound is called a thiol, and it's actually the group is called a subhydral. Sometimes they call it subhydral or thiols. I'll call, I'll call it SH a thiol. A lot of people do that. So SH on the end. And we'll see this in a lot of an, our amino acid side chains, thiol. And we're going to go through these again. I'm going through them now, and then we're going to go through them again. Um, you'll find that when uh, I teach this semester, I go through things a few times. Um, aldehyde. Let's talk about this um, here. We have a carbonyl group. A C double bond O is called a carbonyl. And it's really special. Um, you guys remember electronegativity? Recall that word at all? Electronegativity is um, you have some uh, elements that are bullies. And they, they need the bonding pair electrons. So what they will do is they will hog the bonding pair electrons. So oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. And so see, there's four electrons here. Those four electrons are going to spend more time with oxygen than carbon. And it makes that oxygen partially positive and that carbon partially, um, partially negative and the carbon partially positive because the electrons are spending more time. We're going to go over this again. Um, so if this carbonyl is on the end of a molecule, it's called an aldehyde. If it's buried in the middle of a carbon chain, it's called a ketone. If it has an OH on one side, it's called an acid because this hydrogen can be donated. Not a lot, but it can be. And ester is not just an old lady's name, 
but it's this acid, instead of a hydrogen, you have another carbon chain. And an amide is that carbonyl with an amine group. And here we'll, we'll see this in our, um, uh, in our proteins. It's very special, there's some resonance there. And we'll talk about these later, those, ac those phosphoric acids. All right, so these sub uh, substituents, these um, functional groups, um, are really where the reacting is going to happen. And the reacting happens with the lone pairs on all these groups. So oxygen has how many lone pairs on it? Two. Nitrogen has one. Sulfur has two. So you see either an oxygen, a nitrogen, sulfur on all of these, right? So that's what's going to be doing the reacting. Oh, yes. Should there Um, a thiol S, uh, ether? No, I, I don't know. It's not very common. We don't, I don't think we see it in um, biochem, so it'll be a, like a thiol ether, sort of a... I've never seen one in my limited experience with organic chemistry. But these are the ones that we're going to see this semester. And there, there could be. But we just don't see I just it. say because he has two pairs just like oxygen. Yeah, it does. But see, it's actually, you'll see it, the, the thiol is actually just like our alcohol, right? Except it's going to be sulfur here. But we just don't see it interrupting a chain like we do with an ether. So alcohol group, it's bent. It's pole, it may, causes the, the structure to be um, polar just like our water, right? So you have these lone pairs that are re ready to react. We have different kinds of alcohols. Okay, so when we define whether an alcohol is primary, secondary, or tertiary, we look at the carbon that owns the alcohol that's bound to the hydroxyl group. So here, this carbon here is bound to this oxygen. This carbon, so we have a carbon, what's hanging off of it, and then the OH. So this carbon is bound to that. It's not bound to any other carbon, so we call it a primary alcohol. This carbon here is bound to this one. Does everybody see that? So you have a carbon, three hydrogens off of it, carbon, two hydrogens off of it, and then an OH. Let me see if I have. So the ethanol, you have the carbon. You have the carbon. And then you have three hydrogens off of it. One, two, three, right? And then the carbon, two hydrogens off of it, right? One, two, and then what's next is the OH. So everybody see that I got that from that ethanol. Okay, so now this carbon is bound to the OH. So to determine whether I have primary, secondary, or tertiary, I'm going to look at this carbon that's bound to the OH, and I'm going to say how many other carbons is it bound to. If it's one or none, it's primary. Let's take a look at the secondary one. It's easier to see with this one, this, is, this carbon is bound to the OH. How many carbons is it bound to? One, two. We got that? So that's a secondary alcohol. Tertiary alcohol would have it bound to three carbons. The carbon that owns the OH is bound to one, two, three carbons. Now, reactivity. What's going to happen to an alcohol? An alcohol will be oxidized. Either it will it can, it can react with other things in other ways, but one primary thing that we're going to see happening is it being oxidized. Um, later on this semester, we'll talk about oil rigs. Oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain of electrons. We're going to make it a whole lot easier in biochemistry. We're going to talk about adding or losing hydrogens 
or oxygen. So if you add oxygen or lose hydrogen, then that's oxidation. If you add hydrogen or lose oxygen, that's reduction. More hydrogens reduce, more oxygen oxidize. I'll use that's the word oxidize. If you add both oxygen and hydrogen, it's not going to be a, a, an oxidation reduction. If you lose both, it's not going to be a reduction. So you have to do the opposite. And we're going to go over that at least 50 times. Okay? At least 50 times. I, Elijah knows I would like to repeat myself during the, um, during the semester. So primary alcohols oxidize to aldehydes, and secondary alcohols oxidize to ketones. We're going to talk about that momentarily. Aldehydes. All right, so here we have that um, carbonyl group. C double bond O, and here we have these lone pairs there as well. Um, you can have, uh, you'll notice with the name, they either have aldehyde in the name, or it will end with an AL. You don't need to be responsible for naming, um, but just so you can recognize. So an aldehyde has that carbonyl at the end. So we get this when we are oxidizing an alcohol. So we can go backwards. We can reduce an aldehyde to get alcohol. We can add two hydrogens. If we further oxidize an, an aldehyde, take this hydrogen off and put an OH, that's going to be an acid group. All right, ketones. We're not going to really see a lot of ketones um, ketone bodies later on in the semester, but we don't see a lot of ketones in biochemistry, but that's that carbonyl buried in the middle of our carbon chain. Um, acetone, um, you don't want to put that on your nails, it will dry them out. You want to use the um, different types, the non-acetone. It's every, it, it, it dries everything, yeah. We use that in labs, actually, to help dry glassware, right? Um, acetone is a very good solvent. Um, Ethylmethyl ketone, um, that is, uh, we name it by, it's a what? I think it might be, yeah. It does, they're, good, uh, they're good solvents. So we get, we get a ketone from oxidizing a secondary alcohol. So before we had an OH here and a hydrogen on this carbon, we took those, um, they took the hydrogens off and that oxidized it. So we can reduce it again to get it, secondary alcohol. Carboxylic acid has the carbonyl with the OH. So what we're doing is we have that uh, carbonyl, uh, used to have an H for an aldehyde, but we took that H off and we put an OH on it, and then that's gonna be an acid. The reason why um, it's an acid is that this hydrogen can be um, donated. This hydrogen ion can be donated. So acetic acid, is um, this one, no one calls our acids by the standard name unless they're trying to be a pain in the butt. I used to work with somebody like that. That they would like walk around calling things the long name and you wanted to punch them in the face. This guy, he used to, I don't know what he did when I used to work with him, he, he would get his hands on somebody's textbook and he would read a chapter in his textbook, and then walk around for the next two weeks using words whenever he could, appropriately and inappropriately, from that chapter. So it's a lot of fun. You're like, hmm, what chapter did he read this week? So this is acetic acid. Now, what do you know about the strength of these acids? What do you think? We eat this. You think it's a strong acid? No. So organic acids, the ones with the carboxylic acid group, are going to be weak acids, right? So if you have 100 acetic acids, one will be ionized. Right? One will have donated its proton. We can reduce it to um, aldehydes, and we can condense it with alcohols. We'll talk about this later to form esters. All right, so they're weak acids. Remember this. HA stands for a generic weak acid. The hydrogen is the one that's going to be donated, and the A is the rest of the molecule. So think of our carboxylic acid. We have the hydrogen ion and our, um, what we call this is the conjugate base. So 
What does this double arrow mean to you? Yeah, it's a reversible reaction. Right? So this HA means I can go, oh, I can lose the proton and donate it. And here it is swimming out in solution. And we have this A minus. But what if I take a look at the reaction this way? All right? Because the arrow goes, goes this way as well. Oh, then this is accepting a proton to produce an acid. What accepts a proton? A base. So an a definition of an acid is a proton donor. A definition of a base is a proton acceptor. So here we have the acid, HA, is an a, a weak organic acid. And A minus is going to be the conjugate base. We'll talk about um, that in a little bit. So here's formic acid. And it can donate a proton to make our conjugate base. Now, if I could draw these to scale, I would draw an itty bitty arrow this way and a big arrow the other way because not much of it is ionized. So the equilibria, remember Le Chatelier's principle? You guys should read about that, Le Chatelier's principle, um, is that it's going to be mostly, if I have 100 acids, 100 of them, or 99 are going to stay with the proton, one of them will let it go. All right, Ka. What does that mean to you? A Ka is an equilibrium constant. An equilibrium constant measures how, many pro how much product versus reactant do we have. This is a reversible reaction. So at the end, we're still going to have, we're going to have some products and some reactants left over. The Ka is telling us how much of each are we going to have. And if you were to write a, an equilibrium constant, it would be the concentration in molar of the products over the concentration of the reactants. So if you have a big Ka, a big value, a big value means you have a lot of products. Small value means you have not money, you don't have a lot of products. It's still mostly reactants. So because these are all weak organic acids, you have times 10 to the minus fifth, times 10 to the minus fourth, because it's mostly still the reactant. Do you guys need me to say that again? Okay, um, a Ka is an equilibrium constant. It's the concentration of the products over the reactants. If you have a large Ka value, or K value, then you have more, react more products, right? The top number is big. So that means you made a lot of products. If you have a small number, less than one, then you have more reactants. You didn't make a lot of products. So I said that if I had 100 acetic acids, right, very few, or one, less than one, would donate its proton, would go to products. So it's mostly reactants. So that's why these Ka's are small. Let's get that a little bit. All right. So these don't formic acid, acetic acid, propanoic acid. These are all organic acids. They have that carboxylic acid. So because of that, they have very small Ka's. This is less than one. This point zero zero something. And so they don't make a lot of hydrogen ion. That's why we can eat acetic acid. Now, the formic acid has a larger one than the acetic acid. So what can we say about formic acid? It's a stronger acid than acetic acid. That's, uh, formic acid is what is in ant bites. And that's why it stinks, right? Um, we're not, our vinegar is only 5% acetic acid. So you're not drinking pure acetic acid. That, that would not be advisable. Um, so, so you can see this is one carbon, this is two carbon chain, this is three carbon. So what's happening to the carbon, the, the, the acid strength as the carbon chain gets, you know, the, it's getting lower and lower. So as you get a longer and longer chain, the acid becomes a weaker and weaker acid.
inductive effect. Yeah. Yeah. It's stronger. Yeah. Bond. It pulls. Yeah. It pulls the. Uh, More stable. Yeah. Now, what does this P mean before this KA? Does anybody know what a P, as in pH, pKa? Yes, Elijah. I'm hoping you know that. Yes, it's the negative log function. And what happens is, when you have the P function or something, a big number becomes a small number. So you see pH, that's the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. If you have a lot of hydrogen ion, you have a smaller number. So a pH of 1, right, is a lot of acid. That's a strong acid. So a, a definition of a strong acid means it donates a lot of protons. So you have a lot of protons around at pH 1. It's a small number. pH 10, that's a bigger number, right? But that's a base. There's not a lot of hydrogen ions around. So what happens is your Ka, large number, means strong. pKa, small number, means strong. Can you repeat what you just said? Sure, absolutely. I can repeat myself. Uh, the, the P function is negative log. And when you take the negative log of something, it makes a big number a small number. So here you see that formic acid is the strongest acid. It has the smallest pKa. All right, the ether group we said um, is uh, just an oxygen interrupting the carbon chain. Um, we don't really see ethers in biochemistry. Diethyl ether used to be an anesthetic. Yeah, we're really not going to be talking about ethers too much. I still want you to know what it is. Um, but uh, a good idea to know that you have an ether is the name has the name ether in it. So that's easy to know. And that it's an oxygen interrupting the chain. All right, subhydro group. We are going to talk about subhydro groups. They are very important. Um, it's called a, a, a thiol group. And um, one thing that is very important in biochemistry is that we will oxidize a thiol by putting um, two thiol groups together and um, getting these sulfurs to bond together. So this is what we call a disulfide bridge in our um, protein. Um, so this is an oxidation uh, reaction. This is a part of holding our three-dimensional conformation or shape of our, of our proteins together. Esters, really important in biochemistry, especially with our triglycerides. What we've done is we've taken this uh, carboxyl group, the, carbon, the carbonyl with the oxygen. The acid has the hydrogen there. What we've done is we've taken off that hydrogen and um, put another carbon chain. And what it comes from is when you have an acid and you put together an alcohol, we, uh, and we take out the water molecule, um, you get that ester. So let's take a look at this. We have acetic acid. right? the carboxyl group with the OH, and then we have an alcohol. We're going to condense, meaning take water out, right? And here on the carbonyl side, you have the acid part, and then on the um, oxygen side, um, you have the alcohol part. So here, you, this is how you get your esters. Esters aren't so stable, all right? You can um, break them apart pretty easily, all right? Um, enzymatically, so they're, they're not going to stay together um, too much. Um, right. You can also have uh, the acid um, be a phosphoric acid to get a phosphoester. You can have the alcohol be um, a, a sulfur or a thiol, so you can get a thioester. But at this point, I want you to focus on what an ester group is. You know that you can have variations, and we'll see those variations later on. Here's a phosphate ester. This is for our, our phosphate um, phospholipids. We might have a long chain here and a long chain here. And here, you're putting on this phosphate group, and that makes it very polar. But we'll get back to this later. An amine group has uh, the nitrogen. So ammonia is just this. Nitrogen with three hydrogens and our lone pair. And we can have a primary amine where we um, now here, to look at primary, secondary, tertiary, we're looking at the nitrogen itself. So for alcohols, you're looking at the carbon that owns the OH, right? Here for, for our amine groups to determine whether you're primary, secondary, or tertiary, you're looking at the nitrogen itself and how many groups are on it. So here, primary amine has one group on it. Secondary amine, two groups. Tertiary amine, 
three groups, and then we can pop off one of these electrons and form another covalent bond, and that will be a quaternary amine. Quaternary amines are permanently positively charged. I use this in some chromatography uh, separation where DNA is really negatively charged. If I poured it over something that is positively charged, then it's going to stick to it like glue. So this is how I got the Chinese hamster ovary DNA out from my, uh, the drug that we were trying to purify. Okay, so we'll see the, the lone pair doing a lot of um, reacting, actually. Here's an amide group where you have the carbonyl together with the nitrogen, and we'll see this in our proteins. So you condense um, an acid and an amine, and you'll get um, an amide. And this is where we'll see, here's one amino acid and here's another one. An amino acid has an acid and an amine. It's not too bad, right? With one carbon in the middle. And so what you have is the nitrogen on uh, one amino acid reacting with the carbon of the carbonyl on the other one. And then we remove water and we get this, this uh, peptide bond. It's also kind of called an amide. And we'll see later that it has partial double bond character. All right, so this is practice. Don't look at your notes. All right, what is number one? Those of you give those of you that have had organic, give other people a chance to like think. You can look at your notes, not at the this particular slide. Go back. The O8 hydroxyl group is part of a alcohol. Number two, what does this look like? Has that carbonyl buried in the chain? Ether is the, uh, the ketone. The ether is the oxygen buried in. The ketone is the carbonyl buried. All right, this one looks like this. The carbonyl on the end with no OH. Aldehyde. This one, COOH, we'll see sometimes. That's going to be acid, carboxylic acid, or just acid is fine. And here is the conjugate base. Well, you can see that the conjugate base will have an ATE ending. All right, that will be the carboxylate group. So that's the conjugate base. I'm not going to test you on that part. And again, the test will be recognition, not drying out. It's very different, right? Recognizing rather than saying, draw me a carboxylic acid. That's very different than <coughs> pick the carboxylic acid out of this group. It's a lot easier to do the second one than the first one. All right. This one is called a thiol or subhydro group. Second one, you have that car carboxyl group, the C double bond O, and then instead of a hydrogen here for the acid, you have another chain, old lady's name. Ester. Up here, oxygen interrupting a carbon chain. That's that ether, right? You guys are like, oh my god, I need to study. All right, how about these? Nitrogen containing without that carbonyl is just called amines, right? Here we have a secondary and a quaternary. And then this last one is the carbonyl with the nitrogen. That's the last one we looked at. And amide. Yeah. You guys, that's, you do need to know these groups. So that's some practicing that you'll have to do for the quiz. And, you know, I, I know for the quizzes you can have your homework out to look at it. Again, if you're not organized with it then you'll spend too much time looking for the answer, then so you, your time will run out. People that are prepared for the quiz do fine. They can get it done in half the time that I allow. If you're not prepared with the homework being done, then, then you're not going to be able to do it. So for the quiz, you don't necessarily have to memorize. For the test, you have to. All right, You have to memorize these for the test. What are the quizzes do, right like before the um, or something like that? They're, they're, the quizzes um, I have due for 
chapter one and two, which I'm hoping I'll, I'll have covered before the end of Thursday or do Sunday night. So I'll try to make announcements and send you an email about when they're due, but you should check often. I'll make some sort of announcement when everything's due. What's the format of the quiz, like multiple choice? Multiple choice. Some, um, I reserve the right. These aren't, the first two aren't, just so that you can get used to the online quizzes. Pick three out of the five. But I'll tell you how many. Is that, a, is that okay? Pick three out of the five, sorry. I'll tell you how many. Okay. So now let's talk about organic reactions. We're just going to go through a um, few. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to see how these functional groups react, interact with each other. We're going to look at um, a few types or classes that are important to biochemistry. The first is nucleophilic substitution. So what we have is a nucleophile and an electrophile. And let's see if I can do this. Um, a nucleophile is something that seeks out a nucleus, right? A nucleus is possibly charged. So a nucleophile will often be partially negative, maybe with lone pairs, and it will seek out an electrophile, something that wants electrons. So something that wants positive will react with something that wants negative. But not, it's not ionic, it's just the attraction of partially positive and negative. So let's take a look at um, this alcohol. No, that's not going to work. I'm sorry. This isn't mine. No, it's not going to work. All right. What we have here, the nucleophile is going to be this alcohol. The nucleophile is going to have the lone pairs. And it is going to do the attacking on this um, electrophile, this phosphate. Let's take a look at this phosphate for a second. This phos phosphorus has four oxygens around it. The oxygens are electronegative. That means they're bullies for the bonding pair electrons. So look at all these electrons that are around this phosphorus are away from the phosphorus. That makes it partially positive. All right. So this this phosphorus is partially positive because the oxygens around it are pulling the electrons away. So remember the octet that we have for the bonding. Phosphorus can do more than an octet because it's in period three. But remember the octet, so you're going to have the, the electrons around it. Well, you're supposed to, in a covalent bond, you're supposed to share. But you don't share so equally. Just like in my family, kids don't share so equally. Several years ago, I got one iPod. Like, this was a long time ago. I got one iPod for all three kids. Guess who had it more? I have three kids. The oldest. The <coughs> oldest had it more because she is kind of a bully. Anyway, so um, she would spend more time with the So that's the oxygen. It's take, spending more time with those bonding pair electrons. It's going to pull, we say, electron density, electrons away from the phosphorus. It's sort of a little naked out there. The nucleus is a little out there, slightly positive. And then here's some lone pairs on this oxygen. All right, the lone pairs are saying, I want something positive. So it goes and attacks. We call it nucleophilic attack. Because the negative lone pairs, and we have two of them on this, on this oxygen, will come by and you can draw an arrow from this oxygen, put lone pairs on this oxygen. I tried to do that, the writing, but it wouldn't let me. Um, lone pairs on this oxygen, and draw an arrow right to this phosphorus. And so the oxygen is going to now, see? There's a new covalent bond between this one, the phosphorus, and this oxygen. And then this leaves. The OH here and the hydrogen here, they leave. So this comes in and attacks and forms a covalent bond. So in a nucleophilic substitution, we are going to be attacking here. So this happens with the acid and an alcohol. It can happen with an acid and an amine, as we saw with the peptide bond. <coughs> we'll see that a lot more. Um, 
It can also happen with hydrolysis or cleavage. Um, with water, water can come in and So here is our ester. Can you guys see that? And so water will come in. Water has, we saw, two lone pairs. It's going to come in and attack the carbon of the carbonyl. And then we have this leaving. So these arrows that I'm drawing are where the electrons are going. So the ox oxygen of the uh, water is going to attack the ester, and then it's going to give the acid, which again is just, all right, and then the alcohol. So what we're doing is we're breaking this bond. You're cleaving. You're breaking this one right here. Okay. So this comes in, forms a new, so this is, this OH is from the water. And it, it cleaves, or so when we say hydrolysis, I want you to think water's coming in and breaking up a molecule. Elimination is when we're removing atoms to form a double bond. Um, those of you that have had organic chemistry in the lab, um, you've probably done this. You've removed water to form a double bond. It's called dehydration. Um, you can also move, remove not just water, you can remove ammonia as well. So we're here, we're, we're removing ammonia here, and then that's forming um, a double bond here. The reverse of elimination is it as addition. So um, we have this um, in our citric acid cycle, actually, in the Krebs cycle, where we take fumarate, we add water to it and make malate. We have a double bond here. And what we're doing is we're putting, a, we're putting water across that. So what we're doing is we're taking away a double bond. So elimination is putting a double bond in. Addition is you're adding across that double bond. So you can think of water in two parts, the OH and the H. The OH goes on one side of the double bond, and the H goes on the other side. You can see that here. Here's the double bond. The OH went on one side, and the H went on the other, and the double bond went away. It can go this way. So it can go reverse, and that would be elimination. But I mean, it's, it's the OH can go other. Yes, it can. Yep. But an enzyme will put it in a specific spot. Okay. Uh, isomerization is not so hard to know. It's just what you're doing is you have the same atoms, you're just connecting them differently. So glucose and fructose have the same numbers of carbons, oxygens, and hydrogen. They're just connected differently. Um, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate have the same number of um, carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, and one phosphorus. But you have the carbonyl um, as an aldehyde here. Here you see it as a ketone. There's a second carbon. So you're, you're rearranging it. You'll see this in a lot of what I call getting ready reactions. You're getting ready for something else to happen. Redox. We are going to spend an incredible amount of time over the next six weeks on redox. Um, they're the reactions that are in your batteries. They're the energy producing reactions. And so when we are um, consuming food and using it to metabolizing, we are oxidizing the food to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a molecule that is ultimately oxidized. Carbon. Because if you look at carbon dioxide, it's a carbon with two double bonded oxygens. You can't do more than that. It has no hydrogen and two oxygens. So if you look at our sugars, they have a lot of OHs on them. Right? So you're kind of there a little bit. Our fats have a lot of hydrogens on them. So what we're going to do is take our sugars and our fats and we're going to oxidize it through our metabolism reactions to get to carbon dioxide. All right, we're done with the semester. No. That's really the entire semester. We're going to be talking about how we get from our sugar molecules, from our fat molecules, 
to this molecule. So when you oxidize, you're going to remove hydrogen and or uh, add oxygen. And so um, oftentimes, um, I don't show you what is reduced. So if you have an oxidation, something has to get reduced. You don't have just oxidation. You have to have, have redox, reduction, oxidation, oxidation, reduction. So um, that's why we have this little O. It's an oxidizer. An oxidizer gets reduced. So we'll talk about that a lot. So primary alcohol gets oxidized to an aldehyde. Aldehyde gets oxidized to a carboxylic acid. So what you're doing is you're going from a carbon-oxygen single bond to a carbon-oxygen double bond and removing oxygens, I mean hydrogens here. Aldehyde, you're adding in another O oxygen bond here for the carboxylic acid. So again, this is our shortcut. Lose, it, can, it doesn't have to be two hydrogen atoms. You're losing hydrogen atoms. It doesn't have to be two. Or adding in oxygen. But again, if we are adding in both or losing both, it is not going to be a redox reaction. So on the exam, I'll show you an ex uh, uh, a reaction, and I'm going to ask you to classify it as one of these types. And the first one you're going to test for is redox. You're going to say, what is the difference between the reactant and the product? Write that down. What is the difference? And then you're going to figure out which one it is based on what's happening. Um, the last um, one that we're going to review is about solubility. So when we say like dissolves like, it, what we mean is Things with similar intermolecular, intermolecular forces dissolve other things with similar intermolecular forces. So um, we will talk about intermolecular forces next chapter, but um, water is polar, so it's going to dissolve other polar or ionic things. Um, organic molecules, um, small ones, with polar functional groups will dissolve in water. So acetic acid, that carboxylic acid group, has the oxygens that makes it polar. We'll talk about what being polar means next chapter. Um, if you have greater than five carbon in an alcohol, it starts to be uh, a non-polar. Polar. So you have this battle between um, two parts of a molecule. So things that dissolve in water are called hydrophilic. Things that um, do not. Um, dissolve in water are called nonpolar or hydrophobic. And so say you have a fatty acid which has a long chain and an acid group. So if the chain is really long, then it's going to make it nonpolar. That polar part of it is just too wimpy. It's not going to be able to get it to be soluble in water. If we have molecules that have both a polar and a nonpolar part, we call it amphipathic. Okay. You got to know this, this term. So amphipathic means it has both a polar and nonpolar, so a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic part. 